Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Political Education for Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Nitra, and today we're talking about the HISD board controversy, the takeover, also the current superintendent, Mike Miles, and the state of affairs within the districts, and everything that led up to this point. But before we get started, make sure to visit our website at politicaleducationforfreedom.org for additional resources and insights. I'll post information from this website. It'll be posted online on our website. Also, subscribe to us on your favorite streaming service. Just search for Political Education for Freedom podcast. You can also follow us on all social media platforms at educate to free us. Uh, so let's get started. It's a lot I want to talk about, but I want to try to hurry up and get it all in one episode. I would hate to s- split this episode up, <laughs> even though it is a lot. But I think most of this stuff is necessary and a lot of us don't know much of it. But we're going to jump into it today. So first, let's talk about TEA, background information on how it was formed. So Houston, much like much of the South, was, of course, deeply segregated. The city's Black population faced systemic racism in all areas of life, from housing to employment and especially in education. Now, in 1876, the Texas Constitution mandated the creation of a public school system. This was almost 10 years, maybe 11 years after the Civil War ended. So we can call this the Reconstruction Era, but we know Reconstruction didn't last very long. The schools for Black children were, of course, underfunded, overcrowded, and lacked basic resources compared to the white counterparts. Despite the challenges, the Black community in Houston was determined to provide quality uh, education for the children here. So in some background history on the beginnings of this being established by Black uh, educators, in the early 1900s, Black educators and community leaders in Houston started to organize and advocate for better educational opportunities. One of the most significant figures in this movement was Jack Yates. Uh, Jack Yates was a former slave who became a prominent minister and community leader. He was instrumental in establishing the Houston Colored High School in 1893. Uh, That was the first high school for black students in Houston. It later became known as Booker T. Washington High School. So, Yates, along with other organizations such as Houston Negro School Board, worked to improve the quality education for Black children. They organized fundraising drives, lobbied city officials, built partnerships to secure funding for schools. But it wasn't just about fighting for getting the resources. It was also a fight for equity in education and challenging the legality of segregation. In the 1920s and 30s, Houston saw a series of legal battles aimed at addressing disparities between Black and white schools. One of the cases that's most notable was in 1936. This was a lawsuit filed by the NAACP on behalf of Black teachers in Houston The case was Carter v. Board of Houston. They argued that the Black teachers were paid significantly less than the white counterparts. The lawsuit was part of a broader strategy by the NAACP to challenge educational inequality across the country. So though this case didn't immediately result in equal pay, it set the stage for future legal battles and also raised awareness about the systemic discrimination in HISD. Now, beyond the courtroom, there's also grassroots efforts for the fight for educational equality. Um, The Black community in Houston established their own schools. Jack Yates actually 
started the first school, but there's also a Jack Yates High School that was named after him in a historically black neighborhood in Houston, which is also involved in all of the current mess that's happening. Not involved for bad reasons, but it's just an, a school that's being targeted right now. Community established their own schools and edu- and their own educational programs to supplement the inadequate public schools. So churches, civic organizations, local businesses played a role in supporting the initiatives. During the 1920s, there was a school that was created based on community-driven education, which was Wheatley High School. That was in 1927. And that school, of course, was named after Phyllis Wheatley, the first published African-American female poet. This school became a school of Black excellence in the community. It produced generations of Black leaders, scholars, and professionals who went on to make significant contributions to Houston and beyond. Wheatley is important to remember because that will come back up. The school, Wheatley High School, will come back up in just a second. So now let's go to moving to TEA because TEA, of course, is involved in this. In 1949, the Texas legislator established the Texas Education Agency to oversee and improve the state public education uh, system. They was tasked with ensuring that all Texas children receive a quality education, regardless of race or socioeconomic status. This agency played a significant role in the implementation of the desegregation laws following the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board of Education, um, which that law established separate but equal Uh, schools were unconstitutional. However, in Houston and other places among Texas, the implementation of the desegregation laws was met with resistance. So TEA was often caught between federal mandates and local opposition, leading to complex and sometimes contentious desegregation processes. In some instances, the agency's Actions were viewed as enforcing integration, while in others, they were criticized for not doing enough to dismantle segregationist policies. And you can guess who's on which side of it. Enforcing integration, that's probably the ones who did not want integration. And criticizing for not doing enough, those were probably the ones against segregation. Now, During this period, of course, the different areas were pushing back on integration, resistance, all the way 100%. In many cases with integration, the federal government had to step in and force these institutions to integrate the schools. That's also the case in Texas. In... And... Useful to point out that we know Brown v. Board was in the 1950s, right? But the Texas courts made a ruling actually in 1970 to force these schools or these districts to segregate. So, yeah, we think, oh, 1954, that's how we teach it in school, really. It's not even though it's it's only half the story, but we teach it. So when we're teaching to these kids, 1954, Brown v. Board says that they have to integrate the schools. The kids are thinking 1954, okay, 1955, everybody all together. <laughs> but it's, no, that's not what happened. That's not how it happened. Um, and then they go to Ruby Bridges. So they like, well... After Ruby Bridges, everybody had to, of course, be in the same schools to get along, right? No, that's not what happened. These people put up resistance for more than two decades because a lot of the cases that were filed against these districts 
weren't settled until the 90s, <laughs> if you can believe it. And I'll also connect that because if you think about some things that was happening in the 90s, this is what, I mean, th they just gave, not gave up, but they exhausted all resources as far as trying to fight this. They appeal, they go in, they sue, they appeal, they appeal the appeal, they wait for it to go to the different courts, the appellate court. And so this is NAACP is fighting cases from the 50s, which it was before the 50s. But let's say when the decision comes down, let's just take 1954, Brown v. Board, they're fighting these cases from 1954 all the way until not settling these cases until 1994. <laughs> so this is how long these districts fought back to not allow integration of the public schools. Now, let's just be clear there. We do not understand, <laughs> but we know what the fight was about. The fight was about resources. If I'm paying the same amount of taxes you're paying, my child's school should be up to par with your child's school. It's not like they were saying, oh, black people, you only 10% of the population. So we only going to fund your schools 10% of what's in a pot. That's not what was happening. These were stark differences in funding. Um, there's actually... And, and I love this book. It's called We Face the Dawn. It gives the different strategies about how um, Robinson and Oliver Hill, it talks about, and the book is by Margaret Eds. I normally suggest a book anyway on my other episodes, so might as well. So the book is called We Face the Dawn. Now, in the book, it details the strategy, the legal strategy behind the Brown cases, because it wasn't just Brown. We know this started, the cases started in South Carolina. And actually, it's even more outrageous to listen to when you hear the cases of how it initially started with us fighting for equality. And so it starts from South Carolina cases. And I'll just briefly talk about it because it is outrageous. I think people should just know what happened. So basically there was a school, and this is just me paraphrasing because I don't have all of the facts 100%. It's just me going off of what I can remember reading about it. But it was a district in the area. They were uh, black, of course, black district. And white district, uh, had some uh, school buses. They had extra school buses, let's say that. And the black schools wanted a school bus, one school bus from the white schools. And they were like, no. So <laughs> that sort of s sparked the cases that led to Brown v. Board because it was uh, a slew of cases. Like I said before, with the case in Houston, these were NAACP suing on behalf of the black teachers. That was in 1936. This is them saying another case of inequality where they not paying us what they pay them. And then you have more cases to come where it's saying, okay, not only are they not getting paid, but our kids aren't getting the same amount of resources as the white schools. And the NAACP lawyers on the case just broke it all the way down to the numbers where there was a huge disparity in the amount that was allocated for each black child versus each white child. Now, I don't want to give the number because um, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to go back in my notes and find it, but it's, let's say it was like $40 for every white child and like $5 for every black child. Let's say that's the case. <laughs> I don't know if that's real, if that's the real number. I'll be sure to add it into the show notes. 
So that was a part of the, their strategy in fighting these cases. It was like, look, we could talk about emotions. We could talk about mistreatment and the justice system and this and that. But numbers don't lie. Let's look at the numbers. Let's just look at the numbers at its face value, just basic, look at the numbers. And there will start differences in the amount that was being invested into our schools versus their schools. And not only that, it was our money. It wasn't like we were asking them for anything. I think I did an episode about this previously about the difference between us getting the same amount of resources that is ours. It's not like we're no one is giving us anything. If you pay taxes, then those taxes should fund the areas or the schools where you live. It should fund the roads. It should fund the buildings, the trash, whatever it is. You're paying for that. That's the service that you're paying for. Or else it's no use of having a government. <laughs> What's the point if they're not doing that job? It's no use of us paying taxes. We're supposed to all be paying collectively plan, paying taxes to take care of everyone. And so that's not the case that was happening, of course, during the segregation era. And this was well, the reason why they had to end segregation. They couldn't, they had no excuse. They could not account for it. They could not say this is why we are continuing to do this, except for we are just racist and we think you should be paying for our kids, which is why I think we have a whole nother reparations case for the Jim Crow era. That's just me. I think that not only should they have given us what's ours, meaning we should have gotten what we paid, our kids missed out. I wasn't alive, but still, like my grandparents, my great grandparents, they missed out. They lost some stuff. I think they are owed that. That number can be quantified. You can actually put that number. You can do the math and figure out how much did Jim Crow take from black people? Because they didn't just treat us like shit. They took stuff from us. They took tangible monies from us. So I think that's a whole nother case that I think that should be addressed along with them stealing the labor of our ancestors, but I digress. And I, I'm going to do an episode about that too, because this stuff can be quantified. It can be put in numbers. It's very simple. The The cases uh, with NAACP and the schools, they put it in numbers. So you can add all of that up over time. So the white people that's alive, that say my people didn't enslave your people, that's true. But your parents and your grandparents took from my grandparents and my great-grandparents. And there's numbers. We can actually put it in numbers and tell you what they took from us. So you can't scurry that excuse. You can't get by with that one. Oh, I wasn't alive. You was damn sure alive. Matter of fact, your grandma's still alive right now. You can go in there and talk to her, ask her ask how much, how many pools and shit and parks and shit that they had that we didn't have. That shit can be quantified. If the government paid for it, the government has a record for how much it costs. So we can just kill that noise with this, oh, I didn't do this. Yes, you did, and I can show you how, but I digress. So with them actually being able to put this in numbers, the federal governments, really, they didn't have no choice but to force the states into abiding by the law. They fought from 1950s. Now, TA was established in 1949. Brown was in 1954. But a Texas judge in 1970, William Wayne, ordered, and that was in the Eastern District Court of Texas. So he ordered TEA to assume the responsibility for desegregating Texas public schools. Now, this is how TEA gets the power to be able to take over schools because of this order that was put in. Now, at the time it was put in 
to help. It was the state level, but of course it came down from the federal level. So this is them stepping in to force these people into abiding by these laws. In 1970, after they do this, they now, TA now has the power to take over school boards. They end up putting this order in the Texas Education Code afterwards. So now it's in law that they can take over school boards or take over districts. So now they've taken over districts before and every time the state has taken over a district, it didn't end well. Um, being exact, TA took over a total of 15 districts in the past. And HISD is the largest. There's no other uh, district that's been this large. HISD is the largest district in Texas. It's also the seventh or eighth largest district in the country, but it is the largest city district. HISD serves a, now I have the exact number. <laughs> HISD serves 194,000 plus students. It's 274 schools and the minorities is about 90% of the total population. The district, these demographic numbers were 2023. 90% of the student makeup was Hispanic American. 27% was African American. 8% was white students. And 3% were Asian American. That's the total demographic makeup of and I would say that's that seems about right. Looking back from when I started school, uh, I think that African American percentage was much higher. But um, we can talk about that at another time. <laughs> so this, so of the fifteen districts that were taken over by TEA, four. Four of the 15 closed. The Texas Education Agency took over about 15 districts in total. And of the 15, four of the districts closed completely. In 2013, North Forest ISD closed. And that was for uh, poor academic performance, also some financial failure by the district. Now, those kids were then absorbed by uh, Houston ISD. Th those kids with those low test scores are now being merged with kids whose test scores are probably average, not below average, but some, in some areas below average, but not so much as North Forest. So you have, and I want to be clear about, I need to put a Venn diagram up. <laughs> I want to be clear about how this area is the biggest target, especially right now. So you have that North Forest ISD area, and they are further north, right, of the city. Those students, they're now going to Houston ISD schools. Now, they come from the north. So what area of Houston ISD are those kids going to start going to? Of course, the northern area. This happens in 2013 and Mind you, when they closed North Forest, it wasn't like they asked HISD, <laughs> did they want to take these kids? Not saying that they didn't want to, but if you think about what's going on, it's like, why wasn't there any type of transition into the district? I was there when it happened. 13 North Forest closed. 2014, my class, the school population, and this was a middle school, went from 300 to 800. Mind you, nothing changed with the staffing. 
right? So my school had the same amount of staff with twice the amount of kids. And these are all these Northern schools. So we catching hell, <laughs> right? So that first year of that transition, we just get, so what happens? Bam, class size is double. <laughs> school sizes double. We have the buses, the issue with the buses. That was another thing because as a teacher in the classroom, you're like, I can't teach kids if they're not here. And then you're like, they're not absent. What is going on? They catching the school bus, but the school, the buses take so long, not their fault, because they're coming, they're an hour away from the closest North school in HISD. And the North area of HISD is really central. It's on the outskirts of, you can look at a map and see, it's not very far if you think about it. Even from downtown, it's they're like maybe two exits from downtown. That's the north area of, and these kids are coming from a whole nother area, an hour away from the northernest part of HISD, right? Not of the city, but of HISD. <laughs> It's taken up two hours to get to school. These kids, typically, they're at least two hours late, depending on how far they were coming from. So you have that. This was not a plan of transition and nothing. It was like, nope, they shutting it down. All these kids, they, I guess they just get a letter. Bam, this your new school. That's it. I don't even remember us having a meeting with the principal, but I don't remember having a district meeting with them telling us a plan of transitioning for these kids. So we come in, they come in, their scores follow them. We also now have to see that these kids are almost two grade levels. Half of them are like two, three grade levels behind. You also have a different population of kids. You got a population of kids that's supposed to get services. How are we going to give them services? We don't even have the staff to give the services that our kids are required to have. And now we have double the amount where we have to offer these kids services. So you can imagine that year was a total complete mess. Now, what happens? The Texas legislator passes a law in 2015. This is two years after the North Forest District closed. This is one year after we got these kids that were two and three grade levels behind who still coming to school late. <laughs> and they changed the law that says that the Texas Education Agency can take over a district if a school has a failing rating for more than five consecutive school ratings, a yearly. So this was June of 2015. They pass a law that says the Texas Education Commissioner has to do one of two things in any district with school that receives five straight failing grades for academic performance. One, they either close the campus or two, replace the elected school board and superintendent. But there's, they offer in this law a phase-in period that gives the struggling schools a few years to meet standards before triggering the law. So now that law came in 2015, right? <laughs> this 2013 is when they closed North Forest. 2014 is when we get the kids. 2014 is when our classes doubled. Just because those kids came in from North Forest doesn't mean that they just automatically catch up with the kids that they came in for. And also, that doesn't automatically mean that the kids who were already at those schools suddenly just instantly become these at-level or above-level kids. That's just ridiculous, right? Here's some of the schools. So if we look at high schools, right, the, I talked about the North area. If we look at high schools, Wheatley High School, you just heard that name, right? Because that's one of the 
schools that were started by Black leaders and civil rights organizations and residents in 1927. Wheatley High School, you have Kashmir High School, you have those feeder pattern schools along with them. So you have Wheatley and Kashmir. Those are the two high schools that they used to trigger this law that was passed in June of 2015. So 2016, and my, my school, my old school was a feeder school to Kashmir High School. So if just listen to, look and listen to the date. 2013, they closed the district. 2014, we get the kids. 2015, they pass a law saying if it's consecutive failing grades for five consecutive failing grades, they get to close the school or replace the board. North Forest, 2014, we get the kids. 2015, they passed the law. 2016, they appoint a conservator over Kashmir High School to address its low accountability scores under uh, state law. We were monitored, the school I was at, the middle school I was monitored as well. This person that they appoint is Doris Delaney. That was the conservator. The commissioner, Morath, he could close the campus or replace the district if that conservator remains in place for more than two years. So 2016, Wheatley receives its fifth consecutive. Now, if we want to use, let's just take on the surface there, the fifth year, 2016, it was the fifth year. So let's say 20, they didn't rate low. 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16, those are five years. Remember, 2013, they closed North Forest. 2014 is when we got them. Two years of those five consecutive ratings, right, from 20 up until 2016, these are the kids that came from, ha at least half of these kids came from an already failing school district. And they're being thrusted into the schools that were already failing, like uh, Kashmir High School. So in 2016, you had Wheatley High School receive its fifth consecutive ratings. But in 2014, they got the uh, North Forest kids. So even if, let's say those two years, those kids were, the staff was bringing those kids up to level as far as test scores. But then, bam, in 2014, they're hit with twice the, the amount of students with the same amount of staff. You have to look at this and be like, okay, we can't just give it to them all the way. We got to figure out something else instead of just saying, oh, no, the school is failing. That's the end. So 2017, they passed another 2016 Wheatley gets its fifth consecutive rating. 2017, they put in another legislation, which is iffy to me, that says if a district that's if the school, if you have a struggling school and you surrender control of that school to a charter network, a university or a nonprofit, you get a two year exemption from the 2015 law that was put in place. So just on the surface, just hearing that you like, huh? Yeah. They're saying, you know what? You can save the school or you can be exempt from having either your school being closed or us taking over the whole district. If you give the control of this school over to a charter network, a university or nonprofit. Now we can assume, cause we're going to get to where these, uh, we're going to get to some information about the charter schools. So just, we just going to keep that over here. I wish I did. <laughs> I talked about this Monday night and so somebody said 
I went through and read the chat and somebody was like, somebody get her a white boy. I definitely need a white boy. <laughs> and don't be surprised if you end up seeing a white boy being edited into this, <laughs> to this podcast episode. 2017, Wheatley gets its sixth straight failing grade. Now, in 2017, I know for sure that my my former principal went to Wheatley to fix the school. He's one of those principals. He's no longer a principal now. I forgot what he's over, but um, good guy. He knows how to run a school. He knows how to fix schools. Let's put it like that. He left our school to go to um, fix this school, um, to fix Wheatley. So, and that only lasted, I think, two years, I want to say. So, and I think this was in 2017 when that happened, when he left. So 2017, they get the sixth straight failing grade. And then you have total of 10 schools in 2018 that is now on the chopping block for having to either give control over to the charter networks or face the sanctions from the 2015 bill, meaning the school either closes or the board is taken over. Of course, the board, 2018, they got 10 schools that could trigger this new 2015 bill. So they debate over it. The board debates over it. And they look at the Energized for STEM Academy that charter network uh, to possibly give control of those schools to this charter network. We, the citizens of Houston and Houston ISD was pissed off and was like, no. And here's why the charter, that charter school network has a history of self dealing real estate agreements. Yeah. So that's another <laughs> piece of the puzzle that people are you can just gloss over but that's the thing that's going on with these charter schools right so if if you don't it's not all charter schools let me just say that it's some because they have made it in certain states they've made it to where charter schools are now a business so there's an article that i've read Oh gosh, this, I just read this like a few weeks ago where this charter school had a private plane. Now, <laughs> this is another uh, type of, these are public, these are private public charter schools or something like that. So IDEA public schools, um, this is in um, 2021, they was, raise questions by some people because they were spending money on things like private jet and luxury drivers. Now I'm trying to figure out why the hell are the kids getting on the private jet? Like, why do they need this? I don't understand. So they ended up getting, being placed under a conservatorship type come welcome back if, to the political education for freedom podcast you're listening to your host Nitra, and we are discussing the ins and outs of this hisd current leadership its takeover everything leading up to the takeover and a little bit of history into these types of takeovers and these behaviors that are not at all new. So if you're enjoying what you're listening to, visit our website at politicaleducationforfreedom.org. Make sure to subscribe to Political Education for Freedom podcast on any streaming service to stay connected and informed. You can also follow us on all social media sites at educate to free us so we're gonna jump back in when we last left off we were talking about the newest law change and the 10 failing schools in hisd they had a choice the state can either take over the entire board 
which is the takeover of the district, or they have the option of handing over power leadership of those 10 schools or the failing schools to hand them over to a charter network university or nonprofit to get a two-year exemption from the law that was passed in 2015. And we talked about how we received this sixth uh, straight failing grade in 2017. And then in 2018, the 10 struggling schools, the board or HISD board and its parents debate over giving control of the campuses to a charter network called Energize for STEM Academy. Now, there was a lot of pushback from turning over control to the charter network because of the, and I mentioned before, they have a history of self-dealing real estate agreements. And I want to talk about, I, I wanted to briefly explain what that means quickly, but there's a lot here. But the charter school network energized for STEM Academy is a group. It's a, so these are in district charter schools, right? Now it's founded and led by one person and th this charter school Specifically, it's founded by Lois Bullock. Okay, so this, so Bullock heads up three corporations operating eight charter schools. Over five years, Bullock, the owner of these charter schools, received $17 million from the three companies. Now, where did that $17 million come from? It came from management fees and rent on the campuses she owns. So this is basically what they're, this is the meaning behind self-dealing real estate agreements. Now, Bullock's private corporation also received millions in low interest or no interest loans from the Energized for Excellence Academies. In 2014, Bullock was awarded six years of retroactive pay from, which is Energized for STEM Academy. This is a third charter school company. So basically a bonus of 1.2 million. So every, so each dollar that Bullock, the owner of these charter schools, receives, goes directly into her pocket. It's taken from the classrooms. Now, Bullock has been dealing with HISD for about 20 years with these in-district public, in-district charter schools. This, char this charter school thing is big business, apparently. This is when education goes to the private sector or is privatized. Now, Bullock has these in-district charter schools working within HISD, right? Then she teams up later with a former trustee, Mike Lunsford, and they're now in business together starting a charter school in Beaumont. So they're not starting these charter schools to educate our kids or fill in the gaps, which what I think a lot of charter schools can do. They can fill in the gaps of, of public schools. I don't think all charter schools are bad. Some of them are actually good and they are worth receiving public dollars. But when you have things like this with the Energize for Excellence deal that they have because this is not just it's not like they a permanent deal they renewing the contracts for them for this charter network to continue to work with HISD so 
And that's where we have something similar to what I was alluding to earlier about the idea of public schools. This school, they have 143 schools and they use public dollars. This is idea of public schools that I'm talking about now. And I brought them up earlier to emphasize how these charter schools are becoming just huge cash cows. And instead of being about educating the kids, they're more about enriching the pockets of their shareholders or their owners. So IDEA Public Schools and it's IDEA, they have about 143 schools and they recently had to, they were not exactly. IDEA Public Schools was placed on a conservatorship type agreement similar to Kashmir's but the reason they had been placed on it was because there was an investigation into improper spending within the system of, of the 143 schools. They were placed under the conservatorship because of mismanagement or improper spending. Now, th this is the charter school network that I mentioned before that had a private jet. Now, this is, they use public dollars to purchase a luxury driver services as well as $15 million to lease a private jet. And this was two weeks after promising to TEA it would enforce the new fiscal responsibilities put in place because of their the investigation into their financial or improper spending within the system. So they put them under conservatorship, which is they're basically monitoring them. They're supposed to monitor them to make sure that whatever what was off track is now in the process of getting back on track. And while they're on the conservatorship, they use public dollars. Now they've been investigating this. So I'm questioning, okay, first of all, during this whole investigation, y'all missed this $15 million uh, lease to a private jet or this business, because it's supposed to be public education, but it's operating like a damn business, waited until after it was under the conservatorship and after two weeks, they went and bought a damn $15 million lease for a private jet and a private driver services. So what the hell is this conservatorship really supposed to be doing? Because under the conservatorship for Kashmir High School, they were all up in the ass of every teacher, every principal, every assistant principal. They were questioning, because I'm only saying this because I wasn't there at Kashmir, I was at the feeder pattern school and we were under the same conservatorship. So they were monitoring classes. They would just come in whenever they get ready, they would bus in and just sit in there and start evaluating. And they were always like walking together for some reason. I'm like, if it's a lot of y'all and I'm, I'm saying team, it could have been four, three or four people, but I'm like, why the hell all three of y'all need to be together? If you in a school and you supposed to be monitoring the, the school and the instruction and what's going on and what needs to change or whatever, y'all need to split up. That's like having sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade administration all together all the time. No, eighth grade, you need to be over there on your wing, making sure your eighth grade wing is in, in check and together. Seventh grade, you need to be over there making sure yours together. Sixth grade, you need to be over there making sure yours together. Y'all come together for y'all little huddle at the end of the day or the week or whatever and huddle with the principal. But these people were going about the school together like they were joined to the hip. I'm like, this that's not even productive. 
Like somebody should be, they can walk and chew gum, right? But that that shit didn't seem like it. Not the way they was just, it was like it was all together like a gang or something. And I know some of the times when they do certain stuff like that is to try and intimidate the teachers into doing something different. But if you're a good teacher and you're not changing nothing in your classroom. And when they came in mind, I didn't change a damn thing instruction went on as it normally do when they started asking questions i had a funny story that i like to tell people because it's not funny it's funny to me but they like to ask questions and when they do that especially about like how what i'm doing and how i'm doing it and if it's working and all it is i ask them typically to take a test to sit down and take my test or take a quiz Sometimes I'll do a pop quiz with the kids if I know that these type of people coming in. And I tell them to participate. You in here, you got to participate. I did that with my principals, too. When they came in and sat in with me, if you sat in on my class, you was in the class. You wasn't just sitting there being a spectator. No, you were a student. And you were going to learn what they learned today. And at the end of the day, you're going to tell me what you learned in the same way that I do to students. Because you ain't just going to be sitting here just criticizing. No, because you you, gon- you got to learn something, too. You, you need to be in the minds of these young students. Because half of them grown folks couldn't do the work. And that's exactly what would happen. So I would have them take a quiz or a test. And they sit in there and they'd be like, oh, people start getting nervous and shit. Oh, shit, I got to take a test. Oh, shit. And then they don't come in immediately and have to take the test. They come in and they want to act like they the expert and I let them have it. You do. Yeah. Okay. I'm just sitting there nodding and mm -hmm, making sure my class is together because you're not finna come in here and mess up my class management. That's first off. So, yeah. Okay. You got that to say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know what? In the next few minutes you came at a perfect time i'm about to do a little review and we're about to take a little quiz won't you participate with us i sent them grown-ass people down and make them take them quizzes and they be looking like a deer in headlights they don't know what the hell just happened mind you they were just sitting in my class so you can't say that you this some shit you ain't seen in 30 years You just seen it 10 minutes ago. And then I compare it to my students. So they stopped coming to my class, basically. (laughs) That was like, oh, no, we ain't going in there. That actually, I learned that from a veteran teacher. But they continue to go to that veteran teacher class because the administrators, they want to send them to the go on the hook. She got her shit together. You go, it's gonna ain't no gonna be no interruptions and all that. So that's how that goes. It's it's all seeing lights and cameras and shit type. So those people, those same people came in and they were doing all of this monitoring and we were getting feedback and it was people was getting evaluated, getting low evaluated evaluations because the principals were on edge and then that edge that they put the principals is getting they throwing that off on the teachers so it didn't help the environment or whatever they was supposed to do it it didn't help that it wasn't like it was fixing the problem because you just coming in here monitoring and telling me some shit that i need to do and you've i've been dealing with these kids for the past nine months or so or five months whatever I I know these students I know my students your feedback is useless because if you ask the teachers are saying how about you try teaching 35 kids for 50 minutes or for an hour and 30 minutes no interruptions just they just sitting down 35 kids Because remember, the dates, 2014 is when we get double the amount of students 
the same amount of staff in my department. <laughs> this is how bad it was. I'm just give y'all some little bit of insight. And some of y'all know this. If you're my family, you know this already because I'm sure I told you. We had, so we would normally have two clusters, but in social studies, you see everybody. So they normally have like a rotation for students that require additional help, special education, or they have a IED plan or something like that. Those are usually two clusters and the clusters were, and they were different if you had kids. Math, math and reading didn't see every single child. They would see certain kids. So for whatever their cluster is, and usually for math and reading, they had four clusters instead of two. For social studies, there was only two clusters for each grade level. And so each grade level had two history teachers. For me, when I, when I got there, social studies had three teachers. They supposed to have six. They had three teachers. And what they would do is, this is crazy what they did. They had one teacher teaching two grade levels and they would switch in the middle of the day. And so they would set the schedule up where all of the kids from one grade level would see, they would get social studies before the teacher switched over to the other grade level. Yeah, it's wild. So basically, with them doing that, the other times that these students wasn't, because the only le grade level that's tested is eighths, which you would, they should deserve more attention because these kids test. And so what they would do at the other times where this one teacher would switch between two grade levels, they would put a long-term sub in the other classroom. So they would try to get the bulk of the kids to learn from the actual teacher. And then by the end of the day for the non-tested grade level, they were basically being babysat, I guess, if you want to call it that, with a long-term sub. I mean, they have, they don't have to turn in paperwork. They don't have to turn in lesson plans, nothing like that. So that's how they were doing it. That's how short they were at that school, but not just that school, because I'm sure it's, it's like that at other schools, but that's how short they were on teachers. So then in 2014, the number doubles, they were doing this before the influx of kids from the closed district. So now still being short, they're now doing the same thing with this now doubled amount of students from 2014 on up until now, nothing has changed. I'm sure some of that funding from those schools, from the influx of kids, that, that funding doesn't come until the following year. So you're essentially caring for kids without the money and resources for a whole year because the amount of funding that you get is based upon the previous year. Last year, money, this is the amount of money you get this year. In 2014, they were getting the money based on the 2013 numbers. Now, in 2014, those numbers increased, but they don't get that money until the 2015 school year, which is only one year they've now received the funding or it's almost because it's still underfunded, but at least they received the funding based on the number of students or the based on the number of kids that is enrolled at the school from the year before that happens. That doesn't happen until uh, 2015. 
And then you have 2016 is when Wheatley receives its fifth consecutive failing rating. Like, this is what I'm trying to get people to understand what's going on and how this is hurting the one district closing hurt Houston ISD. But now it didn't hurt the whole district. There's 10 schools that were struggling. Of the whole district, there were 10 schools struggling. And remember, the, the district is about two, I think I said before, it's about 270, 273 schools, I believe. So of the 273 schools, only 10 were considered long struggling schools. And these were the schools that would now be under this new law from 2015 that could either get the campus, get the schools, have the schools controlled by a charter network or have the board taken over. So during this time frame where all of this is happening, the TEA changes the scoring system, right? So HISD rated a B, I believe. It was rated a B during when they actually took over. At the time, they actually went in and said, oh, no, we're going to take over. The district was rated a B plus based on the state's accountability ratings. So at the time when the district was rated a B plus, 94% of the schools were rated a A, B, or C. Now in 2022, right now, okay, now we, we're jumping ahead just a little bit because we went from the giving over the control, what happened actually the board ended up not voting to give control to energy, the charter network. And in 2018, April 2018, there were 10 schools, right? In August of 2018, six of the 10 schools ended up meeting the standards. So now it's no longer 10 struggling schools. It's now just four. Now, the other four schools that were still rated low that year, they didn't receive a rating because of a hurricane. Okay. This, of course, you see all of this, what's happening, right? <laughs> you got 20, when they, received the influx 20 2014 they get the influx of the schools 2015 they changed the law 2016 they fall into that category with the new law changes 2017 they changed the law again calling itself giving these struggling schools a lifeline and then 2017 wheatley high school again because they used wheatley high school to claim that oh this needs to be the district needs to be taken over. That was 2017. Then you have 2018. They didn't take up the offer to hand over control of the 10 schools to the charter school network. So then you have, looking at the, the different schools, they just couldn't get a break. You had 2018, there was a hurricane. And that area where those schools in the northern area was hit hard. <laughs> I remember, of course, I was there, but they had to use garbage trucks to get the people out of the area over there. It was hit pretty hard. That was 2018. Now, the, remember the law from 2015, it's, if it's just one school that has consecutive failing grades, then they can take over that school. The state can go in and take over. Now, here's just some facts on what was happening. We had 2018 that wasn't rated. Now, the, the area that was hit pretty hard from Harvey, the schools in that area could not catch a break. But now, all of this time, remember from the 18, there's some other things going on, but I want to get back to the schools and the rating just really quick because I want to recognize what teachers were doing 
under all of this pressure. Now, during all of this, the teachers at that school was working hard to try to bring the school numbers to what they should have or what they were aiming for. And in 2022, Wheatley was rated a C. So this was the school that they were targeting. The Wheatley High School was, because remember at this time now it's four. So in 2022, they meet the, the standard, but the state still took over HISD on June 1st, 2023. Okay, so... They still end up taking them over June 1st, 2023. Now, what was happening in between there is the real that's going to be like, oh, like you, they set, they set everybody up for failure. So when the state took over, they cited a few reasons for uh, taking over the district in, in 2018 is when the this is when the whole thing didn't happen right and the district fought back the district was fighting back this whole time even though they were still going back and forth about these now four failing schools january 2019 is they open an investigation tea opens an investigation about because after receiving complaints of trustee behavior, including violating the Opens Meetings Act to replace the current, the interim superintendent, which at the time was Dr. Lathan. Now, they try, and this is, the, uh, and I'm going to go back to some, some, history about what they did. So there was five board members. They unexpectedly voted to replace Dr. Lathan. Then they end after they did this, they received criticism from the residents, from other elected officials. They ended up reversing what they did by removing her, they ended up reversing it and reinstating her. So I wasn't going to give the whole thing with Dr. Lathan, but Dr. Lathan was, she became the interim superintendent of HISD because her predecessor left. They resigned. What normally happens is the next person in line typically takes over and becomes the superintendent, but they still have to be approved or whatever by the board. They only made her interim superintendent, even though she would have technically been the next person in line to become superintendent of HISD. Now, this is where the funny business comes in because when October, 2018, they secretly vote to replace Dr. Lathan. Now, 2018, if we go by the ratings, the district ratings, right? If because of the hurricane, there was six schools out of the 10 schools, six of them met the standards. Four of them wasn't rated because of the hurricane. So technically they are considered exempt from being a part of the ratings. They, they don't get a rating. Even though in 2018, those schools didn't get a rating, TEA says, um, nope, this is now the seventh year. Wheatley fails in 2019, August 2019. Nope, we gonna take it over. Now, in January, they the TEA opened up the investigations about the board for open meetings act violations. That was in January of 2019 HISD in July, 2019 sued TEA to block the takeover. That was in July of 2019. 
Then August 2019, Wheatley gets its seventh year of failure. Essentially, technically, it's but it's not a straight year because they missed the year in between. But those that's how they work, the loopholes or whatever. So technically, they would not have the legal right to take over because of Wheatley's failure for the seventh year. Because it said that it had to be, these are long-standing failing schools. So in 2019, they, HISD sued him because filed the suit in 2020. The court temporarily blocked the takeover of, they blocked TEA from taking over the, the district. Um, so that was just a temporary block. But then in 2020, the appellate courts upheld the block. So then in June of 2021, the Texas legislature passed, I want to make sure I'm staying in uh, my chronological order so you can see this. 2019, they sue Morath, which is the, that's the commissioner. They sue him July 2019. August, Wheatley fails again. November 2019, Morath says, we're going to take over the district. And he puts in specifically because of Wheatley's failing grades, right? So the investigation into the board members, remember that happened in October 2018, the investigation is now going on throughout this whole process from 2018 into 2019 and up into 2020, when in November 2019, TA finds out that there was some board misconduct. And so he also uses this board misconduct as ammunition. So in 2020, the judge blocks them, right? This is meaning they don't have the, the, because of the suit, they upheld HISD saying, no, they don't have reason to block. In December, the appellate courts uphold it. They say that didn't properly apply the law on all three reasons for replacing the board. This is the appellate courts. This is their decision after the Travis County judge blocks TEA from being able to take over. Of course, they appeal it. It goes to the appellate courts in December, 2020, December, 2020, the appellate courts say, yeah, the Travis County judge was right. And these are the reasons why, because you gave three reasons why you wanted to take over the board. You didn't properly apply the law in those three reasons that you gave. So what they do, they appeal it on the Texas Supreme Court level. This is all in 2020. Now, June 2021, Texas legislators puts in a law that cleans up the technicalities identified by the appellate judges in 2020 essentially helping state officials take over HISD. Do, do y'all see what is happening? <laughs> you cannot say that voting doesn't matter. Now, in Harris County, in Houston, the largely the large metropolitan areas, but we do vote. We don't vote as much as we could, but we do vote. We can't say that. And you can tell because they are targeting our areas, the areas where we do have large population. And the overall population is largely, I guess you can call them progressive. I don't want to say blue, red, more progressive. But the state, this is the Texas legislator, which the Texas legislator, the political makeup is not the same as Houston or Harris County, even Travis County, the makeup is totally different. We always like to tell people, you 
if you live in Houston, you're not in Texas. Because on a state level, Texas is really, these people are insane. They are just dying to red, red-blooded. They vote for Republicans. They don't care what it is. I use, for an example, all the time, I use Uvalde. Uvalde happened. That county, that area, largely went for Trump, about 50-something percent. Okay? After Uvalde, that district, that area went for Abbott at an even higher percentage. This is after half their kids were um, 19, 20 kids or so was murdered in school. And then all of the craziness that happened after the gunman was there. This was a big ass, just clusterfuck. This was horrible. It happening during, after seeing all of how the Uvalde police responded like this was just a complete mess but this area is controlled by Republican lawmakers on the local level and then they are largely Republican on the state level and you look at these small counties like Uvalde they typically go the same way but on the state level we don't function the same way. Houston is not a red area. It's overwhelmingly blue. So our local elected officials basically look like that voting makeup, that political makeup. They're, you know, they're blue. But the Texas legislator is red. And they saw Barath, who is the commissioner of TEA, and he is, of course, Texas Education Agency is that's statewide. That's not locally. That's on the, the state level. Meaning what? These people are, they come from a certain political makeup. So what he does is he gets his people together and go and have them fix all of the screw-ups that they had when they initially tried to take over HISD, they go in and fix up and then the courts find their screw up. And then they go back and say, you know what? We just going to change the law to fix the screw up. And that's what they did. 2021. So then, right. So that was 2021. That was June, 2021. Then fast forward, January, 2023, this is more than, Two years after the ruling, after the appellate courts make their ruling, the Texas Supreme Court, because remember I said after they got that ruling from the appellate courts, they took it up to the Supreme Court. Now, why all of this is in the process, they taking it up to the Supreme Court, they making sure, okay, you know what, in the Supreme Court, we got this in the Supreme Court, but just to be sure, in 2021, they said we're going to pass this law to make sure we'll be able to take over this district. All citing all of the things that no longer exist except for the funny business with the board. So 2023, the Texas Supreme Court says, yeah, TEA, you good to do the takeover. They throw out the injunction that was granted by the appellate courts. And then when throwing out the injunction, they ruled that TEA had the TEA applied the law correctly. And in their ruling, they cite the new law because shouldn't they have, to, this is a new law. This law went into effect while the case was already going on. It changes in the middle of them appealing the appeal, take it all the way up to the Supreme Court, make sure they have the law in place to successfully be able to carry out their full plan of taking over the district. And now 
bam, they got everything they need. They got the law passed. They got the Supreme Court that's going to side with them. This is why, yeah, voting does matter. It matters on your local level, but it also matters on your state level. So in March of 2023, the HISD trustees withdraw the lawsuit because there was no viable path forward because <laughs> that was a new law. <laughs> they couldn't get around that. So. TEA then tells HISD, yeah, we taking over and then we going to get out, we going to kick out the elected board and the superintendent. Now, here's some other few facts about that whole process or what the look of the district at the time that they took over, okay? We know that HISD was rated B plus even after they changed the ratings. They're passing on the accountability rating. They also triple bond, triple A bond rated. 94% of the campuses had an A, B, or C rating. 200 of the 273 campuses, 96 of them was A rated. In the rankings, HISD ranks above Dallas ISD and is in the top half of all Texas school districts. They're in the top half right, of their ratings, meaning it's a whole lot of other districts that could be taken over besides HISD that are ranking below HISD. Why target HISD? What is it? It's, for one, this guy, this current dude, what's his, not current dude, because he's been here a while, Abbott, he has this whole thing with the voucher program. So Abbott wants to do this whole voucher scam it's a scam because his own party is not feeling this whole voucher thing that he's trying to do it's stupid it doesn't make sense and he's going after the place they don't like harris county because it's so blue harris county if it voted with its actual numbers it can flip the state of texas just with harris county alone and if we include some of the other areas like Travis County, Bayer County, Dallas County, all of those together definitely can flip state. Now, Abbott wants his whole little, whatever you want to call it, the voucher program. He wants that to go through. It's most likely not going to go through his own party doesn't believe in the voucher program. So this is not the first time he's targeted Harris County with some type of ridiculous law. He did this with the voting where they claim, right, less government. They don't like big government and all this, right? Yeah, but they passed a law saying that if there's some type of irregularities in a county with a certain number of voters, which the only county in the state, what the number that they cited is Harris County, that if there's any irregularities, even the slightest bit of an irregularity, then the Secretary of State can take over the elections for that county. Now, that county, the only county they can do that with is Harris County. So this is, again, is him targeting Harris County, which is what HISD mainly services. They mainly service Harris County. There's areas that is Harris County, but that's not Houston. But pretty much all of HISD is Harris County. So this is another way they're targeting, and he's doing it through his cronies with the commissioner. Now, I'm going to pick back up with the issues with the trustees and or the board members and what they did and how they tried to do to Dr. Lathan, who eventually left. But there's some history there because the same thing they did in 2018 with the Opens Meetings Act, this happened in 1994. 
So I'm going to pick back up. You're listening to Political Education for Freedom podcast. Follow us on all social media at Educate to Free Us. Subscribe to Political Education for Freedom podcast on all streaming platforms. And catch us on the next episode. We're going to pick this back up with more details into the history behind this racist foolery with these boards and how this helped the Texas Education Agency and Marath and uh, Abbott's cronies to be able to take over a large district like Houston ISD. I'll also talk about this guy who's now over Houston ISD. There was some more information that was released about him, which I've been knowing about. But we're going to pick that back up in the next episode of Political Education for Freedom podcast. Thanks for tuning in.